Before we pray, um, I was teaching, we have what's called a homiletics class, and homiletics is kind of a fancy word for preaching. And so we have uh, six guys who have been in that class, and we've been working through it, and unbelievable to see what God's doing uh, in these young men's hearts, and the gifting, and the calling. And so we, we finished early on Wednesday, and we did what was called uh, improv sermons. And so there was three guys that we, we called on, and they had two minutes to think about it, and they had to stand up and preach a sermon. And so the, the first one, I, I thought all three are gifted in it and did an incredible job. And the first man said, mine always end up being short when I do those. And then the one went for 45 minutes, I think the other about 30. And some of the best sermons that I've heard in a long time, we were, we were all just um, in, the, in the presence of God and it was just beautiful. And so I gave them their lecture that, you know, you as a preacher, you always need to be ready if God calls you to, they say, hey, will you speak at this, you know, baptism? Will you speak at this funeral? The, the, someone didn't show up. So you always need to be ready. And I was just waxing eloquent. And I didn't tell them my greatest fear would be to be called on to preach, you know, without preparation. And uh, so I have this fear uh, my whole life is that my notes won't print out. And I'll get up and I, I won't have them. Um, and I knew the first guy who said he, he always goes short without notes. I go really short. So if you've ever prayed for a short sermon, that's what you're going to get this morning. I, for the first time in 25 years, my sermon is sitting on my desk. So worship wasn't as enjoyable for me as normal. So I was going to call on one of those three guys. <laughs> but... It didn't feel right for your very first sermon to be that. But if, it, if I get done in five minutes, I am going to call on one of you. So you three men, just be thinking about it if you get called up to do it again. I won't call on the 45-minute guy because I, I know I can do at least five. So you, you're off today, Levi. So with that, let's pray. Father, I thank you that we're looking at humility this morning, and you would take away my notes and just really leave me empty before you, to look to you and to you alone, to open up this word and to feed your people. And so God, I, I thank you that I can depend on nothing but this word and the Holy Spirit. God, what a gift. I thank you that you've brought us here together this morning to worship and what you have for us. I pray now, if it's, if it's just short words, that it'd be like those few fish and loaves and you would take it and you would multiply it to minister to every heart, every need that they have. And what we're going to open up this morning, I ask that you would go deep into every one of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would produce and every saint in this building, one who rejoices with those who rejoice and weeps with those who weep. God, we can't find this in this world. I pray that it would be here in the brotherhood and that you would give us that kind of love, agape, for one another. God, where we care that much and we're that united and we're that one in Jesus Christ. So Lord, break down walls that would be between any hearts, any, anything that's in the way of our love flowing into the brethren. God, whatever it would be, would you use this time now to melt it away from every heart? God, do this beautiful work in Southside Bible Church this morning and do it in every individual heart for exactly what we need from this word. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So your outline is, I have no idea. <laughs> but we have been studying through Romans chapter 12, and we're transitioning from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Romans 1 through 11, we have seen something so beautiful. God sent His Son 
into this world to save sinners among who I am foremost. And Jesus came into this world and He went up on a real cross and He bore the wrath of God that I deserved and should have inherited for all of eternity. He bore that on the cross in my place. That's the love of God. And then He came and He obeyed perfectly the, the law of God, perfect righteousness. And He obeyed it in my place so that now I'm wrapped in the garment of Jesus Christ and I stand in His presence loved and accepted and forgiven. And, and therefore, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become His counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And so this gospel gives God all the glory. It's all from him, through him, and to him. And our lives are his. And then Paul says, therefore, because of such a gospel, how then do we live? And the way we live is we offer up our bodies a living sacrifice. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord to thee. And so what we've been learning in chapter 12 is as the children of God who are loved, how, how do we live? And I, I keep using that phrase, Paul's cooking our grits. It, it's, it's never just don't do this. It, it's going to the, to the place where no human can go. It's only empowered by Holy Spirit filled Christians that can live this way. And so he began, and he says, when you walk in the body, um, we're going to look a lot at verse 3 this morning because they tie together this high-mindedness. But when we come in, we're to, th we're to think lowly of ourselves. And anything that we have as a gift to build each other and to serve each other, it's a gift from God. And so anything is, it, it's by faith. I look to God to exercise through me to be a means of grace to His people. And so we all have gifts and we're just saying, God, I believe through faith this gospel and who you are, will you minister to this person through me? And so we just come in here humble, dependent, no gifts, being haughty, because everything you have is from God and it's from God to build up others. So walk in here in humility, God, whatever you've given to me, use for the body of Christ, take it all. I want them built up. I want them to look like Jesus Christ. So here, you, here I am, God. Use my gifts for this body. Don't puff me up. Don't let people applaud me. Look at me. See me. I, to be unnoticed is the best gift I could ever have. All I want is Jesus to be exalted and me to decrease. And that's how we enter into the body of Christ. And then we come with a, a love now that has been given to us by God and through God. We have an agape love that we can unconditionally love with a love that comes from God, through God, and to God. And so we looked, we're not to have love that's fake and phony and hypocritical. We now abhor what is evil. I so love Jesus Christ that I hate anything that's against Him, that violates His purity, His holiness. I abhor I don't just, it isn't just stay away from evil. It's abhorrent. I hate it because I love Christ. And therefore I cling to what is good, which is Christ. Be devoted to one another and brotherly love. Give yourself to each other in this brotherly affection and kindness. You give preference to one another and honor. Want other people's names lifted up not yours. Love when other people are exalted. That's just so opposite of everything in this world and what we're taught. And this gospel brings those kind of people. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, because we're serving the Lord. And so we're, we're, everything that drives us now is I serve God. I, I can't just give up, quit, walk away, dry up. Every time I look to Jesus, it just, it's like a fountain. It just keeps flowing because of my love for Him. And so anyone who's dry, struggling, drying up, don't point fingers. Look to Jesus. 
And I remember when Spurgeon said that. He said, I, I've had dry seasons where I could read and pray and it wouldn't change it. I just stayed dry and then I would come to Jesus and the fountain would flow again. And so I just encourage you that the way you do not burn out is just look your eyes out at Jesus Christ. I serve Him. And it's just, I, I'm never going to get to the point where I want to quit serving because I love Christ with an incorruptible love that will not fade away. So serve through that. And then we're rejoicing in hope. We're a people who have an amazing glory that's coming for us. And so we can be rejoicing ones in the midst of so many things because of the hope that we have at the end of this. And if I had to say anything as a pastor, what I see the most in this flock is a growing rejoicing and hope in the midst of cancers and trials. Uh, it just everyone I meet with, you're rejoicing in hope with whatever comes. It's beautiful. And persevering then in tribulation. I continue to journey to glory. I won't be turned away. I keep marching to Zion because of my hope. And, and then those who are devoted to prayer, and so we said, how does this tie into love? Is the, the, I can't love if, if I'm caught up in this earth, and I can't love if my trials have me so weighed down that all I can do is live in them, think about them, run them through my mind. I'll never be able to love. And then the way I love is I'm bringing you, saints, to God. He's the one who can help. Instead of running to my own wisdom, my own schemes, my own plans, I run to God who has the ability, the power to help. And so we're just a people devoted to prayer and everything. Keep growing in that beautiful dependence of all that we have and the sufficiency of God who loves us and ready to help us. We, we have omnipotence on our side. And he just says, ask. You have not because you ask not. Devoted to prayer. And then I, I love where it isn't just give to the saints. He uses the word koinonia in verse 13 as you, you, you enter into the needs of the saints. You, you have fellowship with them. You share. You're one with them. And so I, it would be easy to say give to people. But it's love them so much that you enter into whatever their need is, whatever they're struggling, if it's finances or just a struggle uh, spiritually, I, I enter into their needs. Their needs are my needs. We have fellowship together in each other's needs. This just kills the world that it doesn't care. They're cold, they're callous. They might say a word to, so that you smile at them and think they're nice, but no one enters into needs. And during COVID, everyone's like, nobody cares about me. And all of a sudden you come into the body of Christ and there's people who koinonia your needs, where you're at, where you're struggling, they'll enter in. So here's the call to have koinonia with the needs of the saints. And then we actually uh, persecute hospitality. We, we hunt down hospitality. We, we use our homes as mission control center for the kingdom of God. And we are going out hunting down people to get them into our homes to love, to nurture, to pray, to share the gospel. Uh, we are, we're a people who practice hospitality. And then last week we turned to this new section where it, it's one thing is don't, don't get upset with people who persecute you. You feel like you have victory if you just don't lash out at them, uh, stay angry at them. I'll just avoid them. And Paul's cooking our grits again. And, and he says, no, I want you to, to bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And we learn that only in the gospel will we ever be able to do that with those who have persecuted and hurt, it, hurt us. And we, we're those who we, we pray, God, would you pour out blessing on them. Change them. Grow them. Let them have your presence. Pray and curse not. And now we turn to verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And there's kind of some debate as to, is this what we do with our enemies who persecute us? We, we actually rejoice with them and we weep with them. And there, there's some commentators who do hold to that. I think um, go more with Douglas Moo. Thinks Paul's kind of been moving around a little bit throughout this section and bringing this back into uh, the body of Christ, what we do with one another. So it, it, there's a possibility it's what you do with those persecuting you. 
but I'm leaning more as instruction to the church. And so we were called now in this koinonia, this one anothering, that we actually rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so when I was teaching the young marrieds, I, I asked them, I said, what do you think's harder to do of these two? I think it's harder to weep with those who weep or rejoice with those who rejoice. And I, I bet everyone in the room would probably answer the same way. And then what, what the number one answer was, was it, it's harder to rejoice with those who rejoice. And the question is, why, why would that be? Why would it be harder to rejoice with someone who rejoices? And it's that whole thing of, of envy. It's that whole idea of, of jealousy. And it's that, that struggle that we have. And it could be physical or spiritual. It could be, you know, someone who's got, you know, more money than me, a better job. I, I work and I work so hard and everyone keeps getting promotions and I never do. And I just, I'm jealous. Could be someone, uh, I, I've, my whole life, I just want to be married and everyone around me keeps getting married and I just, I, I just can't rejoice with them. And then it can be spiritually as, you know, I've had, you have times where you share with someone 20 times and someone walks up and, and says something and they get saved. And you're just like, man, I, I said the same thing. And you're, you're teaching someone and you're, maybe you're a counselor and you're counseling and you keep saying it and from every angle you could possibly say and someone walks up and says one thing and they're like, that set me free. Like that's, that's the counsel that I needed. And so you're, you're looking and you're like, well, man, why, why couldn't I have broke through like that? So there's this a, a jealousy. It can be physical. It can be spiritual. And, and what Paul's calling us to is when we are one, when we really are this one in Christ with one hope, you know, one spirit, one calling, all that we have together in him, it's as if I'm being promoted. It's as if I won the prize. And so there's this ability, there's this oneness in the body of Christ when all the walls break down through the gospel that we are so one that I just love when someone else is blessed. And I can enter in to their joy as if it was me. And again, you, you can't do this in your flesh. No one can do that. And in the, the, the beauty of what that will do in the body of Christ when we're all just, man, I I, 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 I rejoice with those who rejoice. You're, you're growing in your faith. I, I'm so happy for you. You're rejoicing in tribulation, in hope. I, I'm just, I'm glad. Instead of this green, envious monster who walks around always upset because other people have it better than you. And, and they got joy and I don't. And you're, you're just living in this place of almost a bitterness. And Paul is saying through the gospel, as you look what you have in Jesus Christ, it is abundant and infinite. And, and now I have everything in Christ. And so I, I just, I can rejoice because of what I have in him. And now I love my brothers and sisters so much because of our bond and our Holy Spirit oneness and our one hope that anything that God brings into your life, I can celebrate, I can enter in and I can rejoice with you. You see the beauty of that? I pray that that would connect for us. Then, weep with those who weep. And it's just the same concept and the same principle. Is that it's, it's not, man, I have so many of my own problems, I don't need everyone else's. Like, I can't even handle mine. How am I going to handle yours? And it's just the whole wrong way of thinking is that now my brother hurts, my sister hurts, I, I enter in as if it's mine. So it's more than just, man, that's rough. I feel bad for you. God's calling for a whole higher standard than anything in this world is, is we are so one that when you hurt, I hurt. So when I hear about your problem, it's my problem. I can't just hear it and walk away and say, man, I hope it gets better. It's just I'm praying for it. I care about it. I contribute to the needs of the saints. I'll, I'll listen. I'll weep with you. I care. Not just cold hearted stuff. And so the gospel brings us in to rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. And my question is what would keep anybody from doing that? 
I mean, I hear that and my heart jumps and I'm like, that's what I want to do. So what would keep anybody from wanting to be that bonded in the body of Christ and that one that we do weep with them and rejoice with them? Well, Paul's going to answer that in verse 16. This is what's in the way of this flowing in our lives and, and in a body. And if you'll go back to verse 3, Paul said, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. There was four Greek words in there that dealt with the mind, how you think. And, and that's the beginning of his argument. And now we come to the end of his argument. And there's three words here for the mind and to think. And so Paul's beginning this argument with, with the mind and not to think too highly of yourself, but lowly. And he comes to the end of the argument, don't think too highly of yourself, but think lowly. And so it's, it's just bookended on both sides. I think this is an issue. And I think what he's calling for is uh, humility. And so look at verse 16. So we need to be of the same mind toward one another. It doesn't mean we have the same mind on everything uh, toward one another. We're going to move into verse 14, chapter 14, where we have differences and we think different. The beauty of the body of Christ is all of our differences. But we have the same mind toward one another. You're in Christ. You are my brother, sister. We're going to glory together. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same goal to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. It's what, uh, who, who read this morning? The, the scripture, Sean, right? Killian? Yeah, it's what Sean read in Philippians 2. To, to have a COVID brain and get thrown into this was just not fair. <laughs> Sean Killian. And so in Philippians 2, he, he, we'll probably read that at the end, but again, it draws this out to be of the same mind that Christ had. And he didn't look to, to equality with God, a thing to be grasped. He didn't look to his prerogatives, his position. He left glory and he came in this humble way in an incarnation. And he said, and he went to the point of being obedient to death. Have this mind that Christ had toward one another. Think the same way toward one another you're a child of God. You love him. You're, you're my brother. You're my sister. I, I'm not looking at all your warts, all your defects, all your weaknesses. I'm having the same mind toward every one of you. You are my brother and sister in Christ. Have that mind toward each other when you walk into the church. Do not be haughty in mind. Don't be high-minded. And God's been working me in this, what he's calling for. I want you to, I just, those guys who preached on Wednesday night, there's such a humility that when they were done, again, it just keeps taking my breath away of the, of the beauty of humility. And when Zab came and stood up here this morning, there's a humility that takes your breath away. And when Wilma shared last week, when she was done, was there anyone besides me just saying, I want to be like her? The, the humility takes your breath away. That's what God loves. I love that song. It said, um, help me to, to love humility. You're a humble king. You're humble. And, and you love humility in your people. Everything about the gospel is to lead us to humility. Everything about this is you are nothing but a hater of God and he's done everything for you and he's doing everything for you today and he is the one who's going to bring you to glory. This gospel is all of grace. It is nothing but humility and God getting all the glory and honor. And I'm just, he loves humility, not chest sticking out. Look at my gifts. Look at me. This, this body needs me. This body's not focused on me enough. Just humility like Jesus, the greatest one ever, modeled washing feet, humility. Guys, this is the gospel. Humility before God and what He's done for me. It just brings me low, not high. And we come in here and we, we come in here in humility before our God, not haughty in mind. Look at me. 
He says, but we come in and we associate with the lowly. And there were two possibilities for this statement. One is the lowly uh, people, and one is the, maybe the lowly service. And so it, it really could be either one. And so what, what we do now when we're not haughty, and we've been knocked off our perch, we come in in the body of Christ in the right place that we should be. Now I associate with the lowly. And if there's anything about our world, it's all about how to get into the higher circles and the upper escalons and the, the groups that approve you and who's who and who's movers and shakers. And everything's about how do I have more appearance, more approval, more acceptance. Everything is always running that way. And, and you come in here and in Christ, we're all lowly. And I don't think like the world any longer when I walk in here. I have a new mind in Christ. And I, 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 I'm the lowest. Is there anyone? Raise your hand if you think you're the greatest of sinners. Thank you. And if you didn't raise it, come see me afterwards. I'm going to preach this verse again. You, just, you think you're the greatest of sinners. I think it was Spurgeon. It might have been someone else. But he was, he was walking and he saw this bum laying in a street, drunk and passed out. And he just said, oh God, if I could trade hearts with that man, I'd be in a better place. And so I, the, I don't think lowly of anyone. This just breaks down racism, economics, all the junk that people use to think they're better or lower or higher. It's just in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's dead. And we're all just lowly. And we look at one another and that we, we move to every need and we care about each other. And so we, we come to, to lowly ones and we, we come to lowly service. Luther got off on his, he doesn't do this very often, but he went off on his commentary about changing diapers. There's, just, there's no service too low that I won't do. I'll, I'll go do, I'll change diapers if I have to. I remember a group of you changing diapers of a man who was one to Christ in the prison ministry and he was on hospice and you people were going over there changing his diapers. I, I will now move. There's nothing that I won't move into that I would consider lowly. And so there, it just that's what this gospel does. We associate with the lowly because we know who we are. There's no task too low for me. There's no person who would ever be lower than I, sh I am. So don't be wise in your own est estimation. Do you know what that means? It's easy to see in others. <laughs> it's just, you, you've seen them. We've been breaking up into little groups, and you break up into little groups, and there's always the one person who's wise in his own estimation. And all you want to do is hear yourself talk. You have the answer for everything. Don't be wise. Quit, quit thinking you're God's gift to wisdom. Wisdom is to know you don't have wisdom. And, and so to go around, look at me, look at, here, here, listen to me all the time, and you're just always talking and you never listen. And so don't, don't think you're God's gift to the church. Don't be wise in your own estimation. I just got it all together. I'm smarter. I've been more educated. Just come in humble into the body Turn to Philippians 2. I just want to read that one more time and we'll close out. I just want humility. And that comes by a right sense of who God is and who you are and what Jesus has done for you. Therefore, and it's a first class condition, therefore since there's any encouragement in Christ, there's so much encouragement in Christ. Since there's this consolation of love, and since we have the fellowship of the Spirit, and since we have affection then and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Have this what Paul just talked about in Romans 12. Maintaining the same love, which is what this whole chapter has been about. 
united in spirit and intent on one purpose, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Everybody's more important than me, lowly. That's how we think. Don't look out for your own personal interests. Don't spend all your days thinking about you, what you need, what you want. Don't live in that, but live for the interest of others. How? How? Romans 1 through 11, the gospel. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality of God with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't stay up in glory with all his privilege and honor and all that he had. He left it. And he kenosis, he, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being coming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the, that's the one who is the head of all of us. That's our example. That's the one we look to. The, the lowly Christ. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so in all of our lowliness, we give Jesus all the glory and honor and praise for everything. That's humility. Christ is all. He's everything. He's everything in the church. I'm not. I'm not. And God will use that. He will use humility in your, mar- in your marriages, in your offices, in your schools, and in the church. God will use humble people. And, the, and, and I've watched it again and again, the haughty ones. He just doesn't use. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. He will not use haughtiness. God works through humility. And so isn't that beautiful? You don't have to be something. You have to be nothing. And God loves to use humble, broken people. And that gives me hope. And that should give every one of us hope. Not the beautiful people, the lowly. The humble people are who God uses. So I pray that God would do that in each one of our hearts. And I just want to close out by what's been on my heart is I, I've seen this by being a pastor for 32 years now. Um, just usually when people like doctrine, the, they, they flood to teaching and all the systematics, and we love that. We teach it. We believe the more you can learn about God is it's to lead you to love Him and behold Him and know Him. It's never an end in itself. And I, I meet again and again people who make their God theology. And that's the end. It's just to learn and keep knowing. And then all their life is, is condescending everyone who doesn't know theology like them. And they're what we call haughty. And you just spend all of their days. And Romans 12 is completely absent from your life. You, you know nothing about Agape and entering into needs, and loving the brethren, and ministering to them. It's, it's nothing but just head knowledge. So what I want to hold up to anyone who's in that place this morning is that Jesus says, come to me. Come to me with all your head knowledge. I've got a couple brothers who are the smartest people I've ever known, and all they talk about is the, the beauty of Christ and how little they know. And so it doesn't even matter how smart, all that. It's come to Jesus Christ and, and let him change you. And maybe you've just walked in here and you just, you know, you've never loved anyone but yourself. You, you just, you can't change. You're, you're angry at everybody. You love nobody. And Jesus Christ has said, I've come to save you from your loveless heart. The condemnation, the wrath of God is on you because God has commanded you to love him uh, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and you can't do it. And Jesus came and he did it in your place, and he died for your loveless heart. 
on a cross, he bore the wrath of God for all this lovelessness and this hatred that you've carried in your heart all your days. And so Jesus now has died for that and he says, will you come to me that you, you, you might have rest for your soul. You could be saved this morning where the God of the universe could look at you by believing this by faith and say, you're not guilty. You're adopted into my family. You're accepted. And so there can be freedom from these loveless hearts that have never been changed. And you, you've learned a lot, but you're not any more like Jesus Christ after 30 years. And to you, there's a gospel that by, by beholding him, you're going to become like him. And Romans 12, I miss it. I miss the mark. I've, I've got real indwelling sin that is fighting me from this kind of love. But I can look, I can look what Newton said, I'm, I'm not what I should be, I'm not what I could be, I'm not what I ought to be. But because of Jesus Christ, I'm not the same. And our testimonies are that, that by believing this gospel and growing in it and living it and looking at it from every angle, I'm becoming like Jesus. And he is making me into a Romans 12 person and by his spirit through truth. And so I pray that that would be the fruit of everyone in this place. Let's go to our God. Father, I thank you for Romans 12. I thank you that despite all of our lovelessness, all of our sin, all of our selfishness, all of our high-mindedness, the one above every name came to this earth and humbled himself. And he humbled himself to the point of a cross, dying for our sins, God, so that we could be forgiven and cleansed and washed. How now do we fight for the top rung? Let us walk in his footsteps and seek the bottom and love the lowly people and the lowly tasks and rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. God, let us wash feet. Let us be devoted to one another's honor. Let us use our gifts and humility to serve one another and help each other become like Jesus Christ. God, give us eyes to see the beauty of what beholding Christ metamorphoses us into. God, grow us in our love for you and each other. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.